Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Before I actually begin this video and go through the whole spiel, if you have a May birthday, go ahead and leave it in the comments of this video. It can be you, your significant other, your pets, your children, whoever you'd like. Just don't send me a book, <laughs> as everyone else <laughs> um, has birthdays, too, that they'd like to uh, celebrate and see on the screen. All right, if you are new here or you've been sitting in the back row and you enjoy what you're hearing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and then make sure you set your notification bell to all. That way you know every time I upload. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, no more ads will be in this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. So, a few days ago, I was outside of my workplace unlocking the ice thing to get a couple bags for a customer. A man rode up on his bike and stopped a few feet away from me. He said, what's up? I had a lot to get done that day, so I didn't even glance at him and said, nothing, working. As I was rustling around the freezer getting the ice, he was talking, and once I pulled it out, I heard him saying, you dead bitch. I was hopeful that he was just mumbling to himself or something and then gave the bags to the customers. And as I turned back toward the store, he continued, I'm going to tie you up and fucking kill you. Get ready to die because we are going to shoot the fuck out of you. I'm going to kill you next time I see you. That was all I heard because I went right back inside and called 911. I hear a lot of random threats at work, but this guy really got to me. My heart felt like it was going to shoot out of my chest. I could hear it beating. The cops are at our store for shoplifters multiple times a day, and since I didn't see a weapon, they were in no hurry to get back. From speaking to them earlier, I knew they had been dealing with a lot that day. Too many people getting all kinds of intoxicated on 420, I suppose. About an hour later, with me keeping an eye on the entrance and cameras the whole time, they showed up to take the report. One of the regular panhandlers who hangs outside heard the man and popped in to say, he's across the street. They immediately went and arrested him. After having me confirm his identity with him facing away from me, I said I did want to press charges made my statement, and was told that he will get a court date, and then maybe I will have to appear and can file for an order of protection. Never had to do this my entire life. Which is nice and all, but I feel like someone who randomly threatens people wouldn't really care about that. He knows where I work. Most likely that I'm the one that called about him, and now I'm worried about walking home that night or any other night in a neighborhood I've been in my entire life. So, to calm my nerves and to give me some closure to the freaky guy on the bike, let's not meet again. Trigger warning, this next story involves eating disorders, suicidal ideation, talks of sexual assault, manipulation, witchcraft, spiritual and cult-like behavior. Listener discretion is advised. I've been sitting alone at home all day due to a storm, and I think I finally feel ready to speak about my experience with a girl I met in college. No one has ever heard the full story, and I'm ready to tell most of it now. Now, to preface, I, a 23-year-old female, 
was 19 going on 20 at the time of meeting this girl. I was also in an unstable and codependent relationship at the time and was utterly depressed, naive and carving a sense of validation of my thoughts and feelings that no one around me at that time was willing to give me. So, subsequently, I was the perfect candidate to inflate and dote upon the literal God complex ego of this one girl. To begin, I was in an acting 101 class my first semester of college and swore to myself that I wouldn't make friends in the two years I was set to be there. This was a community college. I was to go in, get good grades, and leave. It wasn't until the third day, a week and a half since the semester started, and this girl walks in, and you could feel the air in the room grow thin. Her presence was both alluring and yet annoying at the same time. Charisma seemed to ooze out of her pores and shine like a halo from her hair. For more context, I am from the U.S., and when this girl began to speak with a British accent, everyone was confused yet intrigued. Apparently, she had just gotten back from a trip to England with her father. Apparently, she was originally from there. That's when my first instinct rang clear. Why is that? If she has enough money to be flying to and from England, why is she in an acting 101 class at a community college in the States? I decided my curiosity was too frivolous and kept it to myself. Until the next class, when she asked me a question that I unfortunately no longer remember. However, I do remember my initial disgust with her demeanor. She seemed too uh, bubbly, too poised. Something was just off. After that brief encounter, I felt that was all I'd ever hear from her again. However, slowly, she would make remarks to me during the class, and eventually I started striking conversations as well. Then, one day after class, she mentions to me how expensive and annoying it is that she has to wait for an Uber every time class ends. I remember offering her a ride home as an alternative, but she would dramatically decline, saying things like how her parents would get angry with her for burdening me with the task of driving her around. I understood and felt pity for her after that. In that moment, I thought that she was in a household where her parents were overbearing and slightly abusive. So, I decided I would try and befriend her outside of class. She seemed nice, though. I also had this pain in my heart to help her for some reason. And that was exactly what she wanted. So, over time, as we grew closer, I would offer her a ride home. I would insist and say that I'm her friend and that friends help each other out. She seemed to enjoy these gestures. She'd compliment me and then go on to say how tough her life is without a license. Eventually, she agreed, and I took her home. It was honestly really nice to have someone to talk about class with outside of school. Soon enough, after driving her home the past few classes, she invited me in for tea. I thought it was adorable, having afternoon tea and gossiping with a friend. She was British, after all. We both eventually opened up about ourselves and spoke on things besides class. She told me she was my age, she graduated the same year as me, and also took a gap year. She said throughout school she'd traveled to and from England, and I found it so fascinating. She was adopted from a third world country and was brought to England, and then moved to her current town when she was six. She told me about past relationships. I opened up about mine. She always seemed to be the same as me, like she was trying to emulate me in some way. It was so subtle it was difficult to take notice at first. 
If I told her about my apprehension I felt in my current relationship, she'd sympathize and tell a story about how her ex hurt her even worse. I would always take note of the things she said because I was not only her friend, but we seemed to share the same experiences. However, hers were always more severe than mine. In hindsight, I know why it was like that, but at the same time, I just thought about how unlucky this girl was and how bad I felt for her past. Soon, it became tradition to drink tea at her house after class, but I had to be out before her mom got home, and if I were to meet her mother, it would be bad. One day, her mom got home early and was surprised, yet delighted to see me. She introduced herself, and I did the same all while my friend sat and sulked in anger. Her mother seemed delightful, and I was surprised at how welcoming she was. She offered me food and gave me crackers to take home. I eventually confronted my friend, asking why she would paint her mother to be that way. She said she was just kinder to guests than to her. I was confused, but I also fully understood I have a mother who is very similar to that, so I shook it off. One day in class, we get our midterm assignments. We were to prepare a nonverbal monologue in front of the class. We each get our assigned stage directions and are asked to prepare it in two weeks. One of the stage directions was that a girl comes home crying after having been sexually assaulted. Another girl in our class received this one, but was uncomfortable doing it, and rightfully so. A boy in that class criticized her for not wanting to do it, and she ran out of the classroom. My friend and I followed her. The three of us opened up about our past assault and eventually calmed our classmate down. Time passes after that class, and a few classes later, when I was walking with my friend in my car, she all of a sudden runs away from me. I follow her and I'm laughing at her. She had fallen ungracefully to the ground and was in the grass on her knees. I ask what she was doing, ask why she was being a weirdo. What she did was related to our conversation. She looks up at me with some kind of strange fear in her eyes and says that she saw her assault her just then on the campus. I was shaken at this point because I don't remember seeing anyone walk anywhere near us. She said she walked by and stared at her evilly. I was very confused and said she must have imagined it, but she was very adamant about it. I was also even more confused because she had told me she had filed a restraining order against him. How could he be allowed on campus? If he really wanted to go to the same school, there were two campuses in two different towns. So surely he could have gone to the other campus. I asked all of these questions and was met with a little answer, obviously. She said she'd talk to her mother and they will handle it accordingly. It took two weeks to even hear anything about it. I wanted her to bring it up, but she never did. So eventually, I asked and she gave me a story about how she went to the dean's office after a class and got things fixed. I remember being confused because I had driven her after all of our classes. She says that they went after I left, but that couldn't have been because the school offices closed after five and I would always leave right at five. Many of my questions were met with strange excuses, but I remember just letting it go. This was a sore subject after all, and I didn't want to upset her any more than she already was. Weeks pass, and my friend and I eventually become inseparable. We seem to know the ins and outs of each other. We even hosted a friend's giving together at her house with some of the people from our acting class. Then, the end of the semester came, and I could feel the rift grow between us. I was confused and hurting. 
She said she wasn't going for a degree and was just there to take the acting class. I remember being confused. I thought she was a theater major like me. She had said she was, but I guess she changed her mind. She said she was to be auditioning for Lambda, London Academy of Dramatic Arts, in New York City early the next year, and she was probably going to get in and was to never see me again. I remember feeling confused. Why didn't she tell me this sooner? Why did she even get close to me in the semester? Then I thought about it. It was probably my fault that I pushed her to be my friend. But I just felt so bad for her. It was like she was asking for a friend without telling me. Eventually, I convinced her it would be good for her to be in a class with me again the next semester. Partly because I wanted to selfishly keep her close and the other part because I knew, from what she told me, that if she never got into Lambda, that she'd probably end her life. I feared for my friend so much that I wanted to push her to be in the class with me because she had somehow made me think that I was helping her not kill herself. So... She signed up with the class and decided to audition with me for the spring musical. But she wasn't to go with me because she auditioned alone and couldn't talk to anyone before she sang, which I guess was understandable. Soon, her audition for Lambda rolls around, and I managed to come with her and her parents for that weekend. New York City is about an afternoon's train ride away, and her parents were kind enough to pay for my ticket. How I managed to be invited was by her telling me how scared and terrified she was to be with her parents on this trip. So I offered to come, to be a buffer between her and her parents' evil ways. I was met with polite no's, and eventually, just like all my kind offers, I was then met with a yes. Besides, I love New York City. When I learned I didn't have to pay, I was even more excited. Now, for those of you who are this far, I want you to understand, if you haven't already, it wasn't like I was begging this girl to let me do anything for her. She'd answer me in a way that made things seem like I had to insist. Like, if I didn't ask again, she would be hurt, and it would be my fault. In other simpler words, I was being manipulated into doing things for her, but it never felt like it, because I meant it. I was much more generous to friends I had just met at the same time then. So, I arrive in Grand Central Station and was met with my friend and her mother, we walk to the hotel and everything seems normal. We go to sleep and I wake up. And to be honest, all I remember about the trip was how scared I sort of was of this new virus going around. It was January 2020. And how, surprisingly, her parents seemed to be such angels. I remember going to shops with them and they're just talking about how my friend would love this and how they wanted to make this for my friend and how we should go here after my friend was out of her audition. All her parents talked about was my friend. I was absolutely floored. I remember her telling me to stay in the room all day to ignore her parents, but I didn't want to. I now see why. Eventually, we made our way back to the New York City Public Library. I remember going to the top floor, taking a picture of the painted ceiling, standing for about a minute, and then her parents find me and say that they have to go meet my friend right now. She was in the middle of some cherry-colored chapstick or some water. They told me to stay, that they'd meet me later and to explore the city. I said, absolutely not. I was not walking around alone in this massive city. No way. So I went with them. I witnessed their panic as they tried to hurry to her audition 
and find water and the right chapstick in time. All the while, my friend is texting them exactly what she wants and telling them to hurry. We walked about 20 minutes to this building. 20 minutes. My parents won't even come downstairs to tell me something, let alone walk that far to bring me a water and chapstick. They decided to, that it would take too much time to get a cherry-colored chapstick, and my friend would have to just use the plain kind from her mom's purse. We get to the building and meet with her in the lobby. She goes to her parents and sees that they have no cherry chapstick and not the right water. She's furious. She gets mad and just storms into the audition room, never saying thank you. After that, we go and sit in a Panera Bread and wait another 20 minutes. Eventually, she gets out of her audition and meets us inside. She then was adamant on alienating me from her parents and only wanted to talk to me about her audition. She tells me the story, and I can't help but think she's lying about it all. It all just seemed too bizarre, but I don't remember the details. I just remember after the story I told her about my day with her parents, and she was very upset with me for spending my time with them. She scolded me and asked what we had talked about over and over again for the rest of our trip. We went to sleep and left the next day. I remember feeling very weirded out with my friend after the trip. She seemed to be a lot more abrasive with me afterwards and adamant on me not speaking to her parents. Eventually, I learned that the name she had told me she had was actually not her legal name. Eventually, I saw that she had a high school diploma from 2019 not 2018. I asked her about it, and she said that she got a misprint. The misprint turned into her graduating late because she was in the mental hospital a lot. She went to mental health programs, but also traveled back and forth to England, but also went to school two days a week her senior year. She said she had to do her senior year twice. She only lived in England when she was a child. She actually lived in England most of her life. Nothing was adding up. All the stories she'd eventually tell never made sense together. I remember half-jokingly asking her to write a timeline of her life for me because things never added up. Still, despite all the inconsistencies, I still kept her as a friend. The lies were just far apart from each other to feel like maybe I was the one who was wrong. The cognitive dissonance was growing in my mind, and this was just the beginning. Now, before I met my friend, I'd begun practicing the Wiccan religion. I was a solitary Wiccan who lived by the reed. And you harm none, do what you will. I was actively practicing altruism as a form of devotion to the Wiccan moon goddess and horned god. My friend, coincidentally, was also a practicing Wiccan. We had done full moon rituals together, and she seemed to know a lot more than I did. So I usually followed her lead when it came to rituals. They started out tame, making a candle manifestation wish outside sitting under the moonlight mediating together you know we'd make our wishes out loud thus getting to know each other on a deeper level and to discover our deepest desires we have very emotionally vulnerable in these moments together and after our rituals we try all kinds of divination and other spiritual practices we were like our own little coven, you could say. One full moon, just before I had to leave, I asked my friend to do a tarot reading for me on my love life. I had just recently had a fight with my then-boyfriend and wanted to know what she saw. My friend seemed to have all the answers about my life when it comes to divination, and I was trusting of her enough to hear her out. 
She started pulling cards and read the descriptions. Every single card she pulled was a bad one. It said we'd end in failure, hardship, despair, that I had to leave him ASAP. I remember wanting to, but didn't know how. I left that night crying over how horrible that card reading went. To jump back in the timeline, after we started our second semester classes, I remember opening up to some other classmates that my friend and I were witches. I did it in a way to offer spells for help, but my friend was mad at me for outing us. She never wanted them knowing what we did. I was confused. I wanted to help others and invite them into our little world that I love so much. But my friend seemed to see it differently. So I respected her boundary and never brought up our practicing again to other outsiders of my personal life. Eventually, as I know all of you have guessed, the pandemic started in March of 2020. Classes were moved to online and so was our friendship. We would FaceTime almost every day and watch movies while on call. Now, at my college, the musical was cast before lockdown, and I unfortunately didn't get in, but my friend did. She met all of the other theater majors and started talking to them via Discord chat during the pandemic. I was never brought into that circle by her until the summer of 2020, and during that time, and even before lockdown, my friend would try to date the boys in the department and even grow an obsession with two of them. She had told the first one, who I am actually dating now, that she was friends with his favorite Broadway star and that she'd have them meet. He never believed her. After he turned her down, she became angry and started a rumor that he was actually gay. After that, she moved on to another guy who had a girlfriend at the time. She was even more obsessed with him. She enjoyed the chase, the fact that he was her friend and stayed up late and spoke to her all night made her so happy. He had opened up to me and said she was never the only one he spoke to and that he was just a night owl because of his job and she'd just be one of the only people up to talk to. During the course of two months during lockdown and when people began to feel a little more comfortable, my friend and I talked about her maybe moving into my house. Now, I have a large room in my parents' basement and my friend was beginning to scare me with her talks of her parents are awful to her when she's home and it was just them. I also have yet to mention that she does have an older brother with a form of autism, among other issues, and she'd talk about how mean he was to her. She's constantly calling me, saying she's going to kill herself. I was terrified and decided to open up my home to her. This was the worst but best mistake I ever made. Worst because of the escalation of our friendship getting worse, but the best because it really had me realize how awful and manipulative she truly was. She moved in and everything was great. It was nice to be with someone whom I considered a best friend. It was like a never ending sleepover. I had a spare bed in my room at the time and she used that for a while until she brought her mattress in and eventually moved almost all of her things in. Everything she had, however, reeked. Everything smelt like B.O. And when she lived here, she never showered. She'd stay here five days a week and two at her house. She refused to use our shower and never changed her clothes. She just sat on one side of my room and rot for days. Only getting up to use the bathroom and pick up DoorDash. She'd eat on my side of the room and leave her mess for me to pick up. Eventually, I bought a large trash barrel for us to use, and she'd fill it up almost daily. I tried to do moon rituals with her, and she'd refuse to practice with me. I'd ask for a tarot reading, and she'd refuse. However, the prophecies didn't stop, 
they just got worse. Instead of tarot readings, I'd get dream regals. She'd tell me all these amazing things she'd have. They were said to be prophetic dreams brought to her by the goddess Aphrodite, whom she claimed to work with and worship while I was outside doing my moon rituals. She told me that I'd be a famous actress and I'd date K-pop stars. I'd see the world and be an amazing celebrity. Obviously, I didn't believe her at first, but she'd tell her stories in such a way that it gave me hope hope that my hard work would actually pay off. She had the guidance of Aphrodite on her side, delivering her these messages. I wanted to believe her so bad that I showed all logic aside to cling to the future reality she was feeding me. I was no longer in a sad and crumbling relationship. I would be cast in shows. I'd be happy one day. And that was truly all I wanted. Soon, during that summer, my friend would have another friend over. We'd all hang out, but this new girl was more friend's friend than mine. Eventually, however, my friend began to actively try to keep us from seeing each other, but it never really worked because eventually me and this other girl became close. We would even work out together in my room while my friend sulked in the corner eyes closed listening to music and ignoring us every time we invited her to join us. Also, around that time, my friend had the boy she was obsessed with over. Now, this is not my story to tell, despite the anonymity. I just don't feel comfortable sharing the exact details of this boy's encounter with my friend. But what happened was later told to me by this boy. And it was on a night I was out at my then-boyfriend's house. This incident happened in my bedroom, however, and its details still haunt me to this day. Though, rest assured, nothing too horrible escalated. But if it weren't for some sort of intervening that I can't remember the details of, I don't know what my friend would have truly done to him. I remember after that night, despite not knowing what had happened, my friend grew even more malicious towards me. She began to sow the seeds of the fear of the Greek gods into me, saying they were angry with me and that was why I was having bad days. That was why my boyfriend and I were always fighting. I was doing things wrong and it was driving me wild that I didn't know what it was exactly. All I knew was that I was upsetting the powers above me or whatever by just existing and that's why my life is currently a mess so one night one desperate and hollow night i asked my friend again about my future and what i was doing wrong she looked at me and said do you want it from me or aphrodite i looked to her and said aphrodite my friend enters a meditative state and then looks to me in an evil, sadistic way. Her demeanor had changed entirely. I have never seen and have yet to see anything quite like it. I was told that the reason why I was having such horrible days was because I had to break up with my boyfriend. I had to do it soon or else nothing in my life would completely come true. No fame, no success, no happiness. If I didn't do it by the next full moon, that my life would be stagnant, that I'd amount to nothing. It was so convincing. I can still feel the primer fear I felt right then and there. My friend took the bracelet I had been wearing. That was for my boyfriend, off of me and held it. She told me, still through the persona of Aphrodite, that I was being held down by this bracelet, that in order to rid myself of my boyfriend once and for all, I had to get rid of it soon. I was tasked to toss it in a lake an hour away from me and to do it only with my friend. But I had to break up with my boyfriend first before ridding myself of the cursed bracelet. 
I was stunned. I didn't know what to feel. My friend left the so-called trance and never recalled a thing. I told her about the encounter, how scared I was, the fear of being smited, of disobeying an ancient deity. She told me that I never had to do it. I think it was because she was scared of what she had done to me. Maybe she thought she went too far, or maybe it was all just a part of the act to get me to do what she wanted. I'm not entirely sure, but I was adamant on leaving my then boyfriend. I had worked up the courage and did it a few days later, but everything still felt off. A few days after that, we drove with another friend of mine up to that lake. I invited that friend because I was scared to go with just my manipulative friend. And I remember her being angry with me for inviting this other girl, but I didn't care. I knew something was off and there needed to be more people. And I'm so glad for it because I'm not sure what would have happened to me. We were entirely off the grid when we got there. The GPS stopped working 15 minutes before arriving at the lake. And we got lost trying to leave. It was truly a surreal experience, and me and that other friend never felt fully safe that entire trip, and my evil friend was all way too calm. After that, my friend moved out of my house. I remember we got into a fight. It was at night when she got mad at me for missing my ex. She had wanted me to cuddle her, and I wasn't comfortable with it. And so she went to her side of the room and sulked, waiting for me to beg her to come back, and I never did. We just went to sleep. The next day, I went to go speak with my ex about our breakup, finalize things, give things back. I came home to my friend pretending to sleep. She was laying in the dark, smiling. I told her to cut the shit and talk to me. I explained where I was, and she said she knew that my mom told her, which was actually true. She talked about how she's not getting better. She was cutting herself again. She wasn't eating. She was laying around all day. She made excuses when I tried to help her change her habits. I was worried, but every time I voiced my concern, I was met with excuses and blame for being concerned. So, a few days later, she called me and told me that she'd never change and that I'd have to live with her the way that she was. At the time, she adopted having been diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and claimed to always have had it. I didn't believe her because she only started saying she had that after having watched a Netflix K-drama about a woman with the same diagnosis. I was finally starting to piece together all the lies she was telling me. I also found out a little before our fight that she was actually a year younger than me. After having seen her ID, she explained that the reason that was was because her parents changed her birthday after she was adopted because they wanted a younger baby. She accused her parents of committing forgery. I wanted to take action, but she never did, because it was all a lie. Her chosen name was also a lie. She told me so many stories for the reason why she went by a different name after I found out her given name. Her account was fake. She never lived in England, I believe she made that up after the trip she went on right before classes. I finally saw that everything was a lie. When she moved out, she left all her things at my house. So, my sister and I packed her stuff up and brought it to her house. She told me she wasn't home and couldn't help us, that she had to get adult diapers for her dying grandma, who was also dying. She also said I wasn't allowed to bring her things inside and to leave it all in her mudroom. After we had packed everything into her mudroom, my friend walks out from her backyard 
dressed in the fanciest outfit I've yet to see her in, and gets in the car with the boy she was obsessed with, completely ignoring me and my sister. She never even said thank you. I was furious. I housed this girl. I cooked her meals if she never ate. I listened to her. I did everything in my power to care for her. And all I got was a massive fuck you and my life in shambles. I tried confronting her on her lie and was met with countless inconsistent and self-deprecative excuses. So I just gave up and never spoke to her again. She blocked me on everything after that and never spoke to anyone from my college ever again. She'd gone from social media as well. All of her accounts were changed or deactivated. To conclude, I eventually got back together with that boyfriend and recently broke up with him on my own terms. I just wasn't ready to let go of all that time. I still practice witchcraft, just not Wicca, and am much more educated now than I was three years ago. Like I said, I have a new boyfriend now, and I'm also best friends with the other girl who my evil friend introduced me to. I have my associate's degree in theater arts, and I've done a lot of work in one year for my local theater community. I plan to move to New York City this summer. My life is amazing now that I have that friend, among others, out of my life. I still, at times, blame myself for being so naive and so trusting. I blame myself for the hurt I caused and how everything happened. I'm much more guarded now, but also a lot more headstrong. I also haven't made a new friend since, but I'm actually okay with that. There are many more lies she told that I eventually figured out were lies, but that would just be too much to write out. And honestly, I don't remember the timeline too clearly at some parts, but I wrote here what I do remember. Anyways, thank you so much for listening to this. If you have any questions or want some clarity, just let me know. I'm an open book. Oh, and to my old friend, I hope I never see you again for as long as I live. Trigger warning. This story does include sexual assault. Western discretion is advised. This happened in college. At the time, I was 18 and a sophomore. I had just recently gotten out of a six-year relationship and was starting to get into the dancing scene. I downloaded Tinder and got to swiping. Some background. I didn't want to talk to someone that went to my university because thinking about running into someone I was talking to out in the wild really made me anxious. I ended up matching with this guy. We'll just call him Marco. Marco was 20 and a junior at the neighboring university, about 15 minutes up the road. He had one selfie, and the other two pictures he had were group photos, and they seemed older but didn't think much about it. We started chatting, and very quickly he asked for my phone number. I would say it's a little too early for that, but he kept insisting, and I eventually gave in. After about two days of talking, he started to ask for pictures. I would send selfies. He would ask for more provocative pictures, and I kept shutting it down, telling him I wasn't interested in that, and I just wanted to see where things went. Marco would say how he couldn't wait to meet me so he could kiss me, and every time he would say that, I just changed the subject. We planned a date after a week of talking. He said he knew a good Indian restaurant over by his school, and then we could walk in the downtown area afterwards. I agreed, as it would be a public place. The day came for the date, and again, I started to get a really weird feeling. I told my roommate what we had planned, and she said she would keep her phone on her if I needed her. 
A few hours before the date, I got cold feet and told him my car wouldn't start and asked to reschedule. He offered to pick me up, and I kept telling him no and that we should reschedule, but he kept insisting and started to make me feel guilty. He would say how he was looking forward to it for the past few days and was hurting his feelings and that he would be more than willing to get me, but I'm not giving him the chance. Well, I caved and it was the worst decision I ever made. Despite the feelings I was having, I told him the information to get to the lot outside of my dorm. Right when I got into the car, I realized that this was probably going to be a horrible date. Right away, he tried to hold my hand and asked to give me a kiss. I denied, and he started to drive off. On the way to our destination, he drops that we are no longer going to the restaurant and that we are going to his apartment instead, and he was going to cook us dinner. At that point, my heart sank, and I started to have a small panic attack. I texted my roommate, letting her know. She was worried and said that she would come and get me if I needed it. Again, not listening to my gut, I tell her that it's fine and we got to his place. When I say this apartment was disgusting, I mean it was covered in trash, dirty clothes, and dishes. He said that we had to go into his room because his roommate was home, and he didn't like it when he had company. His bedroom was even worse than the common area. There was only a single path to the bed and to the bathroom. Ugh, it was so dirty. We sat in his bed and he turned on a movie. I can't remember the movie. All I remember is the stench of the room and him starting to make advances on me. Marco started rubbing my back and shoulders. I kept scooting away trying to put some distance between us, but it didn't work. After a few minutes, he started to force himself onto me. He started to kiss me hard and holding my head so that I couldn't move it. I don't know how, but he eventually was on top of me and forcing his entire body weight on me, and I can't move an inch. I'm paralyzed by fear. He doesn't get much further than that because as soon as he's on me, he's just as quickly off and running to his restroom, and he's throwing up. I've never been so thankful for vomit. I don't know why he got sick. When he came out, he apologized for being sick, that it happens all the time, and says he needs to take me home. Trembling, I just get up, straighten myself, and follow him out. I still don't know if he's going to try anything else, and I didn't want to aggravate him or say anything wrong, so I tried to act like nothing was wrong to get home safely, and that happens. He pulls up to my building, tells me that he wants to make it up to me, and I just nod, say goodnight, and get out of the car. Once inside, I blocked him, reported him on Tinder, and deleted the app. I also took extra measures to block him on any social media I could. I didn't tell anyone at first what happened. I was embarrassed because I put myself in that position. I started getting phone calls from random numbers, and when I answered, there wouldn't be anyone on the other line. I would block the number, and a new one would start calling. It got to the point my phone was ringing constantly. After the phone calls were random Facebook and Instagram messages from different accounts, they would say things like, Why are you ignoring me? Why aren't you talking to me? And then they started getting more aggressive and threatening. My roommate started getting messages, and I had to tell her everything. She told me I needed to report him, or at least tell my parents. I didn't do either because I was scared. That is, until I started receiving random pictures of myself. I would be walking on campus, in the dining hall, in class. Then I got one of me in my dorm room. 
It was taken through my window, which was on the second floor. However, the main street was a hill that was the same level at my window, and that is what my room faced, and my bed was in front of that window. I told my roommate, and she made me tell our RA. The RA was very concerned and ended up calling the campus police. I made a report with them. The messages continued, and so did the photos, until one day, about a week later, he approached me on campus. He grabbed me by the arm and tried to take me to his car. I started to yell, and luckily, there were campus police nearby. He was arrested and was banned from my campus, and I didn't hear from him again. This was quite a few years ago, so some of my memories aren't as vivid as I have tried to block this part out of my life. Not many people know that this happened to me. To this day, my family doesn't even know. The only people that know are my college roommate, the RA, the campus police, my therapist, as of the other night, my fiance also knows. So I guess that also means you know too. I want to spread awareness of the dangers of online dating. Always trust your gut. If something doesn't seem right, it probably isn't. Not all online dating has consequences. I met my new fiance a few years later on a different online dating profile. But your gut is usually right, and sometimes it's crucial to listen to. With that being said, Marco, let's not meet again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I move any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Plays, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. For without your support, there would not be a back to ashes. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay vigilant and safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.